Our next reader, two weeks from tonight in this auditorium, will be Richard Wilbur. Please come to the Terrace Lounge in the Student Union following tonight's reading to meet Mr. Wright. You, the university's been corresponding with James Wright for about eight years, trying to get him to come and visit. I'm happy that he waited until this year to come. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce one of the most distinguished gentlemen in American letters, James Wright. I already pulled this one this afternoon, but can you hear me? It's the most stupid question I suppose one can ask of an audience, because if you can't hear me, then you don't even know what question I've asked. <laughs> My wife Annie and I would like to say uh, to all of you that we're very grateful that you invited us, and we've been treated with uh, wonderful kindness and intelligence. It's true, and we're grateful for that. We like to go around sometimes together and uh, find our way as well as we can. People have helped us and uh, brought some very serious beauty in, into our lives by inviting us here and welcome, welcoming us, and we're very grateful. This evening, uh, I would like to make two requests of you. First, I would like to ask that you be patient with me while I flop around some of the proofs of my new book, which is going to be published in, uh, well, at the end of March. And uh, let's all rush out together and buy it. <laughs> No, I mean, but, but, but I ask your pardon if I, if I do a little flopping around with the proofs because my editor wasn't able to get adequate proofs to me before we took off. I've worked on them for a long time. I write very slowly, and I keep revising things. I can't help it. I think I have all the poems in order. The second request I have to make is that you be patient with me while I flop the proofs around. I wanted to begin this evening by reading a whole set of poems which, in a way, are new because not very many of the, the poems in my new book have been published in magazines. They have, a few of them have come out. During the last two years when I was working on this book, uh, and I, I've liked to publish poems in magazines, but I didn't publish many of these. I don't know quite why. But maybe I was trying to understand something. It's a peculiar experience. The first poem is called Prayer to the Good Poet. You might call this poem an Ars Poetica. Occasionally, uh, I know that many of you have written poems, and occasionally one reflects on the very nature of poetry itself, tries to figure out what, uh, 
what has meant something to him in his life and in poetry and in life and how poetry and life might sometimes become one. At a particular time, I heard that my father in Ohio was terribly ill. And he's quite old now. He's still very strong. He's a good man. And I was thinking about him, and I was also thinking about what I cared about in my own life, and I cared about a lot of things in Ohio. I also cared about uh, a certain poet, Horace. I care very much about Horace. When I was a, a boy in high school in Martins Ferry, Ohio, I started to read Horace. I read him further and more thoroughly when I was in college. <clears throat> Horace is, is pretty far away from the, uh, the ideals, uh, the ideal poets of people at the moment. And that's all right. I love him. <clears throat> <clears throat> He'll last, I, I think, maybe <laughs> for the next two weeks or so. Prayer to the Good Poet. Quintus Horatius Flaccus, my good secret. Now my father, a good man in Ohio, lies alone in pain, and I scarcely know where to turn now. Fifty years he worked in that bitter factory. He learned how to love what I found so ugly. Ugliness. What is it? a bitter taste of one body. Now, if I ask anything, I would ask you how to gather my father to your bosom. He knew, after all, how to love Italians. Others said Dagos. One good friend of mine, Benny Capoletti, told me how in a basketball game one person called him a dirty guinea, and Benny did not even slug him. Quintus Horatius Flaccus, my good secret, Benny Capoletti had the fastest hands in that fast Ohio Valley. He could have killed him more than love. My father knew how to bear love. One quick woman, a dark river of labor. He led me and my two good brothers to gather and swim there. I still love the fine beauty of his body. He could pitch a very good Sunday baseball. One afternoon, he shifted to left hand and struck out three men. Every time I go back home to Ohio, he sits down and tells me he loves Italians. How can I tell you why he loves you, Quintus Horatius? I worked once in the factory that he worked in. Now I work in the factory that you live in. Some people think poetry is easy, but you two didn't. Easy, easy, I ask you, easy, easy. Early evening by Tiber, by the Ohio. Give the gift to each lovely other. I would be happy. Now my son is another poet. Fathers, I can go on living. I was afraid once four loving fathers meeting together would be a cold day in hell. Quintus Horatius Flaccus, my good father, you were just the beginning, you quick and lonely metrical crystals of February. It is just snow.
I don't think Horace was a Latin poet. He was an Italian, a premature Italian. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, Annie and I were in uh, Yugoslavia. We had never been in Yugoslavia before. We had gone to Europe. We had done a lot of, both of us had done a lot of wandering around uh, before we were married. And <clears throat> now uh, we go wandering around again, only we wander in more places. I suppose that's the significance of our getting married. We were going to be in Europe, and we heard from some very nice people in Yugoslavia who asked us to come there, and there was a, a, a festival of writers. I don't know if you've ever been in Yugoslavia. Uh, we hadn't been there. We didn't know quite what to expect, although uh, people wrote us very nice letters before we came there. But we had a hard time finding our way uh, from, uh, uh, we have had a hard time finding the Yugoslavian writers in Belgrade, and then we had, to, uh, to, we, we, we had a hard time finding our way from Zagreb to Belgrade. But once we found the writers, we threw through, flew through a wild rainstorm. We woke in the morning, and there was this most spectacular place in Macedonia. And it is, on the honest to God, Macedon. Philip of Macedon. Alexander the Great was born there. We woke in the morning, and the place was so spectacularly beautiful that <clears throat> we started to avoid the uh, literary conferences between the Russians and the communists from uh, Morocco and uh, the rest, and accepting the spirit of the Yugoslavians, who are very beautiful, very independent people, uh, we wandered around on our own. We didn't know the language. We had some French, German, and Italian available to us, and uh, people didn't want to admit that they knew German. They knew it perfectly well. Of course, they, <clears throat> the Germans were down there, and Well, I wouldn't admit that I knew German either. Tell them. <clears throat> we took a walk one afternoon, realizing that we didn't know the language. And the place where we stayed is called Lake Ochrid, and it's way up in the mountains in the, the south central Yugoslavia, in the province of M Macedonia. Afternoon and evening at Oak Creed. I walked with a brown woman in a time that grieved her. The end of summer above blue water, and the weeds came out wondering to her about their names. There was no one there to tell her in Serbo-Croatian the names of that small flower song, and so we had to keep our own words in the vastness of that place. And the dimness of mountains across the huge water and my grieving love wondering about being alone in the world and my love's clear face. How could I tell her about their clear names? I did not know them. I had to hold her. That was all I had. So I began. This one is the sun-blooded eye of a man who drifted weeping downhill into water, gathering, gathering, 
the awake woman. How are young lovers going to take their way and talk together? Well, for the first time in my life, I shut up and listened. Those little birds ate singing in a language that is strange to you and me. So our love for them is a silly love, a sooth gathering and ringing in a coil of snail shells. The one thing that I most longed for to meet in the wildness here was a spider. I already knew my friends, the spiders. They are mountains. Every spider in America is the shadow of a beautiful woman. Shy, marveling at the architecture of my own eyes, I found the best spider here. She spoke the best language, and it spins her face. She wandered ahead of me, muttering to herself that language of grief, the mountains and water that are always a strange face browned at the end of summer. Ahead of me on the mountain path, my browned love told me clearly, come to me and love me clearly with the thinning shadow of the turtle. I missed the turtle the first time I caught up with my love. So we walked on. Then we walked back. Oh, you should have seen her. My love said to me she was just going home between one road and another, and we don't even know in Serbo-Croatian. What is your name? I said. I love you, she said. There's another poem there from y Yugoslavia. I'll come to that directly. I got a pretty rough one here about Ohio, but I think I'm going to keep that out just to be on the safe side. <clears throat> Uh, may I read the, uh, uh, the other love poem from Yugoslavia? This is called, uh, I Wish I May Never Hear of the United States Again. <laughs> That's not true, because I, I regard myself as a patriotic person. That is to say, I, I love my native place and my native language and my friends. We were talking about that this afternoon, some friends together, the matter of learning, learning somebody else's language is also a matter of maybe uh, learning something about love that people all over have for their native places, and I, surely this is patriotism. We are very good at this in America at one time, we've got awfully muddled at it now, but I hope that we recover it because it's not merely a matter of nationalism or attacking someone else. I think it's a matter of affection. And I don't think there's any life without affection. The title of this poem, of course, is from the old one about <clears throat> Nolan, the man put on the, the boat and left aside because he had said, I wish, damn the United States, I wish I may never hear of the United States again. The ringing and sagging of blue flowers and the spider shedding her diamond shadow down on the turtle's body. The old woman's hair locked golden spinning a web out of her clothes. And the girls who have no trouble worrying about the length of their dresses 
as they stroll slowly, vanishing into their own twilight, beside the slim shoulders of the donkeys, I can be silent among these. One afternoon in Northern California, which is a Jack London nuthouse, I almost found my own country. At the edge of a field, I gathered the neck of a buckskin into my arms and whispered, Where were you all this time? Alone all this time, and bored with being alone, I have been walking all afternoon at the edge of a town where the language is only to me the music of mountain people. In Yugoslavia, I am learning the words for greeting and goodbye. Everything else is the language of the silent woman who walks beside me. I want the mountains to be builded golden, and my love wants the cathedrals to be builded by time's love back to their gray. As the gray woman grows old, that gray woman who gave us some cheese and whispered her affectionate sound to my love and me wandering silent in the breeze of a strange language, at home with each other, saying nothing, listening to a new word for mountain, to a new word for cathedral, to a new word for cheese, to a word beyond words for cathedrals and homes. The next poem is a poem about Ohio. I've wondered about this one for a long time. <clears throat> my, it happens that my brother is in the audience. He'll remember this, uh, although uh, I don't know if he would have made quite the same thing out of it that I made. It's called uh, the old WPA swimming pool in Martins Ferry, Ohio. And back there, there was sort of in the 30s and the late 30s, of the people were trying to get jobs, and they used to have the, the WPA. I wish I had the gift to bring into the, the poem the, 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 the humorous response that people made to the old WPA. And I, I know that at one time or another in the, uh, the WPA, uh, Uncle, Uncle Sherman and Emerson Buchanan and uh, Uncle Willie Lyons were somehow connected to this sort of thing. And, and I, think, I think the old man was partly connected with it at one time. They, uh, there were all sorts of jokes about it. Now, maybe those jokes wouldn't make any sense to you. You're all too young. But it was, it was in, a, in some peculiar way, it was funny. You know, it's, it's how to build something. And I, but, I, but I was very moved by that when I was a kid, and I still am by the, uh, the people trying to build a swimming pool. What did it mean? What, why did we, what, did, what we did, did we need with a swimming pool when we had a big, beautiful river uh, right near it, right near us? Well, here's my attempt to understand. I am almost afraid to write down this thing I must have been, say, seven years old. That afternoon, the families of the WPA had come out to have a good time celebrating a long gouge in the ground that the fierce husbands had filled with concrete. We knew even then the Ohio River was dying most of the good men who lived along that shore wanted to be in love and give good love to beautiful women 
who weren't pretty, and to small children like me who wondered, what the hell is this? When people don't have quite enough to eat in August, and the river that is supposed to be some holiness starts dying, they swim in the earth. Uncle Sherman, Uncle Willie, Uncle, Uncle Emerson, and my father, in his way, helped dig that hole in the ground. I had seen by that time two or three holes in the ground. And you know what they were. But this one was not the usual cheap economics. It was not the solitary scar on a poor man's face. That respectable hole in the ground you used to be able to buy after you died for $75 and your wages tatched for six months by the Heslop brothers. Brothers, dear God. No, this hole was filled with water and suddenly I flung myself into the water. All I had on was a jock strap and a bad bathing suit my brother stole from a miserable football team. <laughs> oh, never mind. Jesus Christ, my father and my uncles dug a hole in the ground. No grave for once. It is going to be hard for you to believe when I rose from that water, a little girl who belonged to somebody else, a face thin and haunted, appeared over my left shoulder and whispered, take care now, be patient, and live. I have loved you all this time and didn't even know I am alive. And uh, now I would like to read a love poem from Paris. And I discovered, as many other people have discovered before me, and I pray many people would discover after me, that Paris is a place to come home to, really. Uh, we stay at a place called Hotel Lennox, which is on the left bank, and it's, it's right near the river. I don't want to say anything offensive, but that's a wonderful, uh, uh, a wonderful place to go to bed in. in. And, and well, for one thing, you can get a very good sleep there. <coughs> Annie had been a school teacher in in Paris years ago. She had a, a friend there, this one lovely French lady, Madame Roublevoir. We've gone to see her. She's very beautiful. She looks like a bird. My first time in Paris, I wrote this little poem about the Hotel Lennox. And she loved loving, so she woke and bloomed, and she rose. And many men had been there to drowse awake and go downstairs, lonely for coffee and bread. But she drowsed awake lonely for coffee and bread and went upstairs with me and we had coffee and bread. And then we were so happy to see the lovely mother who had been her mother a long time in this city, broken on the wheel, we went back to the warm caterpillar of our hotel, and the wings took. Oh, lovely place, oh, tree, 
we climbed into the branches of the lady's tree, we birds sang and the lemon lights flew out over the river. There's another little poem about Paris. <clears throat> This poem is called The Streets Grow Young. Now, that, that uh, qu quotation is, of course, from the, the very beautiful poem by E. E. Cummings about Paris. He loved Paris. And Paris is, appeals to me so much because it, it, it is not only very beautiful, but it's also very funny. And C Cummings, this wonderful uh, lyrical poet, is wonderful because uh, he has such utter grace of feeling, and also he's very raunchy, I, I, and very funny. You remember he's getting uh, caught on the that lawn in Paris, and, and <clears throat> by a policeman after he had left a, a cafe. He was all alone. It was right after World War One, and uh, a policeman grabbed him. Somebody asked me about police. But a policeman suddenly gra grabbed. But this is so horrible because. Two or three of the, the, the greatest jokes about Paris have to do with police. I won't go into them now. But uh, a policeman grabbed him, a gend gendarme, and Cummings thought, uh, this is it. You know, he's going to go into a drunk tank. Uh, according to James Baldwin, if you're going to get thrown into a drunk tank, do it in America. Don't do it in Paris. Just don't do it. That's all. And Cummings was there. And suddenly he was surrounded by a crowd of Parisians who kept shouting, I love this. I, that's why I love the city. They were all shouting, Reprieve l'épicier américain. Turn that American pisser loose. <laughs> and the cop did. <clears throat> he has very many beautiful things about Paris, and I was thinking about him on my first real visit to Paris. His lines are about uh, the peculiar quality of the rain. I want to read this poem because, partly because the, the rain here in, in Tucson has reminded me of that Parisian rain. Truly, now we just came from New York and the rain there is very depressing, but there is a kind of rain that's different. Cummings wrote, that wonderful, wonderful man, wrote, uh, in spring, Paris silently utters a cathedral beneath whose upward, lean, magnificent face the streets grow young with rain. He was a wonderful poet. He also is very funny, as I say. Well, when we came to Paris, I had never really known the city. And it was uh, something like June 19th. What a beautiful time to come to Paris and go over to the left bank, get settled in your hotel, and then take a walk along Saint-Germain-des-Prés. And I, 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 I've liked to travel, but I, <clears throat> I, I hadn't known Paris, and I hadn't quite understood what people meant by it. We were walking down the street, and among the strolling students, remember, we had just come from New York. I looked up. I was being so exhausted by New York, and I saw the, uh, one of the Harry Krishna crowd. And I turned and started to beat my head against a, a stone, no, a, 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 an iron fence we were along, thinking this is, is like in Bernard Malibu, you know. Oh, my God, I spent all my life trying to come to New York, no, uh, trying to come to Rome, and the first person I meet is a schnorrer. <laughs> and the kid came up and said, said, Monsieur. He was from Brooklyn, all right. <laughs> the first thing I said to him was, Va-t'en! <laughs> he said, Mi mon sur, and then I said, Hit the road, punk. <laughs> he understood that. Then we found some other things that evening, which were 
Well, here is the poem. The streets grow young. One first summer evening in Paris, my love and I strolled among the young students studying the cathedrals in one another's faces. No rain there. Inside an alley behind our own green bones, a peaked woman of 50 years, I guess, darted straight down at me in the darkness and bluntly asked for a coin. A while later, Harry Krishna, his cigar, his piano, and his orchestra, <laughs> forgave me for giving him cancer. The shrewd angel, the abandoner of his own solitude, the native country of his hand, clambering from pit to scar up his mother's Douglas chest. He has no woman, but he has found how to make a good thing out of hell. No moss grows on those horny wings, even in Paris. While he was forgiving me, the skinny whore staggered past, gnawing her spit-soggy claw of bread. Okay, I accept your forgiveness. I started the Reichstag fire. I invented the ballpoint pen. <laughs> I ate the British governor of Rhodesia. <laughs> but that was a long time ago, and I thought he was assorted fruits and chicken sauce. <laughs> Still all the same, Okay, now hit the road and leave me and my girl alone. The amused Parisian snickered while a retarded fat man on the corner shook a rubber rat in their faces and in the faces of passing women. The poor bastard needed money to beg with or to die with and he can't even beg. In upstate New York, one time, uh, Annie and I have fallen, fallen in love with the hawks up there, the very beautiful hawks, red-tailed red hawks they have. And we met a man there named Dr. Heinz Meng, who is a, a, a student of hawks. And he's devoted his life to birds, but he's especially interested in hawks. And we hadn't realized how extraordinarily beautiful they are. Uh, we use them as a metaphor for some things that, that are kind of confusing. But the creatures themselves, we've seen many of them flying. We never saw this, but he had, actually, he had made a, 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 a film of uh, hawks ex exchanging prey in midair. Everybody has to live. He was, a, of course, a, a Darwinian, and he, and he loved the creatures. Sometimes I think that people who sentimentalize animals secretly hate them. I hadn't realized that before. He loved the, the, the creatures so much. This is a poem about seeing two of the hawks you and I saw hawks exchanging the prey. The, 
they did the deed of darkness in their own mid-light. He plucked a gray field mouse suddenly in the wind. The small dead fly alive helplessly in his beak. His cold pride helpless. All she receives is life. They are terrified. They touch. Life is too much. She flies away sorrowing. Sorrowing she goes alone. Then her small falcon gone will not rise here again. Smaller than she, he goes claw beneath claw beneath needles and leaning boughs, while she, the lovelier of these brief differing two, floats away sorrowing, tall as my love for you, and almost lonelier. Delighted in the delighting, I love you in mid-air. I love myself the ground. The great wings sing nothing lightly, lightly fall. Although the next new poem is about uh, another poem about Ohio, I thought for a while that I would like to have done some translating. And sometimes when one translates, uh, if he loves the poem enough, it can turn into a real poem of his own. So that uh, the, uh, the translation by Thomas Campion of Catullus's Lugete Venere Scupidinesque is, is of... Uh, it's not as good as Catullus' poem, but Catullus couldn't have written it. It's a poem of his own. And a poem I've loved for so many years. So many years. It's the third Georgic of Virgil, in which he he's talking about uh, life in the country for a while. He lived he was a city person but lived in the country. It turns out, by the way, that there is a place in Ohio, I'll be damned, I found out, called Mantua, Ohio, and my son has a girlfriend from Mantua, Ohio. <laughs> Montavano is in Italy. That, that's, it's Mantua in Italy. Virgil is from that place, and it's a little hometown there. I thought I, I might try a translation of that. Maybe I will yet. It's, it's worth handling, dealing with, because he... He loved his language, his native place. But instead of doing that, his eclogue, well, that's the eclogue in which he said, oh, 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 this is the this incredibly beautiful line in the dactylic hexameter, optima dies prima fugit. The best days are the first ones to flee away. But that, in the pause in the line, is ah, and then a rapid word following it. Instead, I thought I would try to describe something that happened to me one afternoon there in Warnock, Ohio. Warnock, Ohio was not the best farm in the world, uh, but there were a couple of odd things that happened there, and one of them was that uh, a cow that we had had a calf, and that is the only birth uh, that I've ever attended. If someone asked me if I wanted to attend a birth, I probably would say no. I'd, maybe I couldn't take it. But uh, I didn't have any choice that particular afternoon. And it took me many years to wonder what I made of it. What I made of it is this poem, such as it is. The poem is called, Well, What Are You Going to Do? I took a nap one afternoon in Ohio at the end of a pasture just at the good moment when Pet, our poor lovely, 
lay moaning and gave birth to Marion, my calf. What was I going to do? All I could do was wake and stand there. I don't know anything about the problem of beautiful women. I was afraid to run 200 yards to call my mother and ask her what to do about beautiful women. Besides, she wouldn't know either. Two hours, two whole hours, while Pet lay mumbling among the Grimes' golden apples that fell from time to time. I ate two or three, maybe. What was I supposed to do there but to eat the apples while Marion's face peeked out slowly? I ate the apples and when Marion was born, I helped her come out. I had been in love with a lot of girls, but that was my first time to clasp the woman beneath her chin and whisper, come out to me, come on, come on, and you can be Marion. I led Marion out of her mother's belly down in the cold autumn thorns and there was a pile of horse manure I couldn't evade and so by God I did not even try. All I could do was fall from time to time. Marion's face was all right, speckled with rust and more white than snow. The one I was the more in love with was Pet, the exhausted. I lay down beside her. She snuffled. She smelled like a Grimes golden apple. Then I carried Marion 200 yards down the pasture. She delicately sprayed the insides of her beginning body all over my work shirt. I don't know that I belonged in that beautiful place, but what are you going to do? Be kind, kill, die? That's about one third of that new book. Uh, uh, let's uh, read some others. Somebody this afternoon asked about uh, the, the poem about Warren G. Harding. Now, I have complicated feelings of my own about the people in Ohio and also about America, my country, and the leaders there, people who have tried to make sense out of it. I've been haunted for a long time. I keep remembering that Edmund Burke, uh, who to me is one of the greatest uh, public figures who ever lived, uh, gave a very powerful oration in the House of Commons in England in about 1775, in which he defended the American colonists against King George III. And to do that openly and clearly as he did at that particular time was the act of a brave man. He said something that's haunted me philosophically. He said, to love our country, our country ought to be lovely. No, to make it, no, it's to make us love our country, our country ought to be lovely. 
ought to be lovely. And doesn't that raise the old beautiful question? People used to make fun of President Harding all the time. He is from Ohio. He was buried in Ohio. And E.E. E. Cummings, we were talking about this poem this afternoon, mocked him very brilliantly after Harding's death. Harding got in some kind of political trouble. You may not remember, but he got into some political trouble, but he cared about life. He was one of the Main Street crowd, all right. And I've heard him sneered at. I wrote my poem about him because I wanted to defend him against the sneer. I'll tell you why I don't think he should be sneered at. He got mixed up with a bunch of political crooks, all right, there in the, in the early 20s. And uh, he was an honest man who got mixed up with, with crooks. Right at the end of World War I, Harding, who was a senator from Ohio, learned that a certain man named Herbert Hoover was to be in charge of the relief of children in Europe. It was called the Committee for Belgian Relief. Harding went over to him, this big, husky, very good-looking, beautiful man, shook hands with Hoover and said, uh, Neighbor, I want to be helpful. That's funny, isn't it? No. Well, compare it with some other public statements we've had in the 20th century. <laughs> like my favorite, Nach dem Sieg des Waffens muss der biologische Sieg folgen. Said Hitler on the eve of the Polish campaign. And after... The military victory will come the biological victory. Well, you take your choice. I know maybe Harding was a failure, but I like him. He may have been a mess, all right. He may have been a failure, but that is a failure I am willing to share. Neighbor, I want to be helpful. Then he, he got confused and screwed up with some other crooks. In this poem, when I refer to the North, I mean simply that uh, Marion, Ohio, is north of Martins Ferry, Ohio. This is called Two Poems About President Harding. One, his death. In Marion, the honey locust trees are falling. Everybody in town remembers the white hair, the campaign of a lost summer, the front porch open to the public, and the vaguely stunned smile of a lucky man. Neighbor, I want to be helpful, he said once. Later, you think I'm honest, don't you? Weeping drunk. I am drunk this evening in 1961 in a jag for my countrymen who died of crab meat on the way back from Alaska. Everyone knows that joke. How many honey locusts have fallen, pitched root long into the open graves of strip mines since the First World War ended and Wilson, the gaunt deacon, deacon jogged sullenly into silence. Tonight, the cancerous ghosts of old con men shed their leaves. For a proud man lost between the turnpike near Cleveland and the chiropractor signs looming among dead mulberry trees 
there is no place left to go but home. Warren lacks mentality, one of his friends said, yet he was beautiful. He was the snowfall turned to white stallions standing still under dark elm trees. He died in public. He claimed the secret right to be ashamed. Two, his tomb in Ohio. As I say in the poem, I've never been there. H.L. Mencken wrote something about the death of Willing, William Jennings Bryan. Bryan died after the, the Scopus trial in Tennessee. Mencken said, I, I love Mencken, but I, I've always been horrified by this, his obituary on Bryan. He didn't die of a broken heart. He died of a busted gut. Well... A hundred slag piles north of us at the mercy of the moon and rain. He lies in his ridiculous tomb, our fellow citizen. No, I have never seen that place where many shadows of faceless thieves chuckle and stumble and embrace on beer cans, stogie butts, and graves. One holiday, one rainy week, after the country fell apart, Hoover and Coolidge came to speak and snivel about his broken heart, his grave, a huge absurdity, embarrassed cops and visitors. Hoover and Coolidge crept away by night, and women closed their doors. Now junk men call their children in before they catch their death of cold. Young lovers let the moon begin its quick spring, and the day and it grows old. The mean one-legger who rakes up leaves has chased the loafers out of the park. Minigan Leonard half believes in God, and the pool room goes dark. America goes on, goes on, laughing, and Harding was a fool. Even his big pretentious stone lays him bare to ridicule. I know it, but don't look at me. By God, I didn't start this mess. Whatever moon and rain may be, the hearts of men are merciless. I would like to read uh, perhaps two more poems. We've been going on for about an hour. Let me share with you uh, the poem. That some people have liked and, and it and there's something about it that delights me. Uh, my wife, Annie, is going to go out of her mind when she hears me say this again, but I still have to admit that it delights me because British critics don't understand, and it, it makes them angry. And they won't be told, and they can't understand. All it is is a description the poem is called A Blessing. It's a description. And if you describe, if you try, it's not obvious, simply if you try to describe something simply and clearly enough, then naturally you're going to bring your own feelings into it. <coughs> a Blessing. Just off the highway to Rochester, Minnesota, Twilight bound softly forth on the grass, and the eyes of those two Indian ponies darken with kindness. They have come gladly out of the willows to welcome my friend and me. We step over the barbed wire into the pasture, 
where they have been grazing all day alone. They ripple tensely. They can hardly contain their happiness that we have come. They bow shyly as wet swans. They love each other. There is no loneliness like theirs. At home once more, they begin munching the young tufts of spring in the darkness. I would like to hold the slender one in my arms, for she has walked over to me and nuzzled my left hand. She is black and white. Her mane falls wild on her forehead, and the light breeze moves me to caress her long ear that is delicate as the skin over a girl's wrist. Suddenly I realize that if I stepped out of my body, I would break into blossom. Before I read one final no. before I read one final poem, I do want to tell you about David. And this looked as if it were a joke in my book, and it's not a joke to me. I, well, no, I made uh, friends with Robert Bly and his wife, and I'm more than friends. Annie and I are, are godparents of two of their children. And uh, but when I, I went out there uh, week after week when I was living in Minneapolis, they live in western Minnesota. I went with Robert when he uh, bought a, a horse, and I uh, love that horse. I, 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 th I, th I think he loved me too. Yeah, he was a swayback horse. He was quite old. He was a Palomino, very nice. And once I had written a poem, and I forgot about it. No, I, I didn't forget about it. There's a, I, I wanted to show it to Robert or Carol, his wife. And I couldn't find anybody. I was in the chicken house. I went over to the farmhouse, and I couldn't find them. There was nobody in the house. I went around the back of the house, and of course David was wandering around. Wonderful old David. He ate the poem. <laughs> I know it sounds as if it were a joke, but it's not a joke. No, no. David is uh, dead now. What, what has ever happened? When I came to put my collected poems together, I have a poem called, or something called, In Memory of the Horse David Who Ate One of My Poems, and here it is. In Paris last summer, a very beautiful thing happened. In France last summer, something extraordinarily beautiful happened to me. Uh, when Annie and I were married six years ago, we discovered that we have about... Uh, have we ever actually tried to count them? We must have about 25 nieces all together. And they're, they're, they're all beautiful. It was, it was quite startling. Two of our nieces came to see us in France last summer. This was uh, Karen and Laura. They were 15 years old. We met in, in Nice, then we went to Avignon, and then we had two whole weeks in Paris. And uh, I, I like Paris so much, so I said, earlier, and there I was in Paris with three beautiful women. Uh, Paris is a, a, a very nice place to, to be with. Paris is a nice place to be with. I'm getting mixed up in the grammar of the sentence. It's very nice to be with beautiful women anywhere, but some, there's something kind of special about Paris. And I, I, I wanted to go uh, to uh, one morning to the, the very great cathedral of Saint-Sulpice. I learned about that cathedral from Annie, who had... Uh, lived in Paris earlier, and I came to love the cathedral. It's on, it's on the left side of the river. It is a spectacularly beautiful, rather reserved cathedral. I mean, it's, it's not flamboyant or anything like that. 
but it's so beautifully built for the music of the organ. And the great uh, organist, Marcel Dupre, had been there. That was uh, even before my time. Well, one morning, I believe it's just about the, it was one of, the, one of the last mornings. I was in a hurry to get over there. And uh, a lot of hair combing went on. All right. We, we made it to the cathedral in time. I thought that I, I would write a poem to, maybe to the ghost of Marcel Dupre, explaining why we were slightly late. to Marcel Dupre, organist of Saint-Sulpice. Singing alone in the only place I will ever know, I am combing my hair this morning. My three loves are going to make me late because the Spartans sat down beside the rock and combed their hair into the sea. Monsieur Dupre, may I come home to you and weep back in secret. I have good reason. I just want you to come over and sit down with me alone. Just you and me. Let them go flower. Every time I wake up in Paris, I see women combing their hair. I know very well this morning over at the Luxembourg Gardens, the slate and plump blossoms are turning green a sheer despair of summer. But ah, Monsieur Dupre, I have everything I ever longed for except the water, tousled and amazing. What does the water think of rushed through their hair? Monsieur Dupre, I bring you with me Karen East, who is young in Paris, Laura Lee, who is young in Paris, and my love young, all three. The fates have changed their names again, and now they are beautiful women. Drowsy, tousled, half awake, laughing. They have kept me waiting half awake in your music, and the Cathedral of Saint-Sulpice is the water that combs their hair, it is the sea, it is the secret stone. Thank you.